Father, we thank you that you've not left us in the dark. We thank you that you have given us your word. And we thank you now as we come to look at it. Lord, we pray that by your spirit you would illuminate it to us. Lord, take everything away uh, that's from me, but everything that's from you, we pray that it will, you will cause it to bear on our hearts in these next few minutes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Please have your seats. Uh, just before I uh, come to um, today's passage, uh, you'll see there's some books out there. Uh, they've um, been sent directly from George Verwer himself, Uncle George. And um, there's a book here, The Purity Principle. I would encourage you, especially if you're a student, this is just to take away for free, no cost, first come, first serve. Also, The Revolution of Love. This is a, a very uh, powerful book. I love to read it once every two years at least. Um, and I would encourage you, again, this one's free. Anything from George Verwa is free. Uh, if you have something you want to contribute towards that, it would be most welcome. It goes towards sending a container to Zambia. So have a look there at the end. Well, this evening, as we uh, come today to today's passage, I, I want to ask you a very serious question. I want to ask you what your favorite food is. What is your favorite food? I wonder if you're with the nation, uh, of the UK that is, and it's a tikka masala, or maybe you're a traditionalist like my wife, and it's all about the Sunday roast, lamb or beef, depending on what your mood is. Or maybe you're one of those who likes a healthy option, a good salad. Or maybe if you're like me, it's something sweet. And you know, when you're uh, away from your home country, you often hunger for those foods that you're missing, that you can't have. When I'm in Zambia, I'm often seen at the fridge praying for a miracle that a Marks and Spencer's apple turnover complete with cream has appeared in the center, but to this day it's never actually happened. And we all know what it is uh, to have that hunger for food, maybe when we've been without food for some time, maybe when we've been fasting or we've uh, just not eaten for a while. We know what it is uh, to be hungry. And as our physical bodies need food, as they long for food at times, especially when we can't get it, so do our souls. And today's passage is all about the love which we should be showing one another as a result of feeding our souls on fellowship with Jesus Christ. So let's look at today's passage. As Peter continues in this message to these Christian exiles, spread out, treated badly because of their faith, persecuted, looked down upon, looked over when it came to promotions, mistreated in the courts, facing physical and emotional abuse. He doesn't tell them just to man up, just to get on with life, or to batten down the hatches and kind of retreat from society either. He definitely doesn't tell them to pay people back, but he commands them to love one another. And this love is, in a sense, is bubbling out like a fountain because, one, they've been born again and because they have fellowship with Jesus Christ and their souls are being fed by him. Well, I was, I was going to say I remember a few years ago, but Collins brought it out. It was 15 years ago. I remember when I was at university uh, in my first year, that would be even longer, uh, <laughs> A believer returning from a mission trip uh, in, it was Mexico then, several months on a mission trip, and I was actually really uncomfortable coming back into that situation at university, into halls, into that new environment after leaving a kind of bubble, Christian bubble environment whilst I was in Mexico and just being really uncom uncomfortable. And I had the perception, and I do think it was a perception at the time, that everyone was just 
smoking weed, sleeping around. Uh, everyone seemed to be getting drunk, and I just felt really uncomfortable and like I could have no part of this. And to my shame, I just withdrew. I pulled away from, from, from the scene, and I spent all of my time only with Christians, uh, the few Christians that I knew. Is that what Peter is suggesting we do? Is that what Peter is suggesting that these Christians in their society do? I don't think so. Or then, second year, realizing the error of my ways, I went to the opposite extreme, spending a really unhealthy amount of time with people uh, outside of the church, out who weren't Christians, uh, all of my time invested in those friendships and relationships. And then, of course, the reality is and was that they influenced me. So how should these Christians and how should we live in our society, the society that we find ourselves in, whether it's in the university or in the marketplace, in the workplace, how should we handle ourselves? How should we engage with the society around us? There seems no hint of of withdrawal through the book of Peter, no hint that we need to withdraw from the world around us, but an encouragement that I hope we'll see through these verses that we're to go deeper in our relationship with the Lord and with our fellow believers whilst loving those around us. See those verses there that start our passage today. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, For a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. I'll be reading from the ESV, as will the um, slides tonight. Let's just unpack that that first verse. So the Christians that Peter uh, is writing to were presented with the very same choice that all followers of Jesus Christ have always been faced with. A choice that they made willingly and a choice that you will have made also if you're a Christian here tonight. A choice when they made, a choice that they made when they responded to the truth of the gospel message. And the truth was and is that they had a problem. The truth that they had sin infested in every part of their being, including their souls, and they needed help. They needed a savior. They needed someone to rescue them. And they made that choice to put their hope in the truth of who Jesus is. And they were made clean. Made clean by the work of Jesus' death on the cross of Calvary. Made clean by putting their faith in him. And friends, that's, that's an age-old problem and it's still with us. It doesn't take only Christians to see this problem of sin within us. Albert Einstein, there's a great photo of him. He realized there was a problem within all of us. When referring to the threat of uh, nuclear war, which sadly is very on topic at the moment, he said it is not a physical problem, but an ethical one. And what terrifies us is not the explosive force of the atomic bomb, but the power of wickedness of the human heart. It's an explosive power of evil. It's an explosive power of evil. And this curse of sin still runs deep in our veins, doesn't it? And it took Jesus' work at the cross to break the power over us but only for for those who made that obedient decision to accept the truth. Only for those who make that decision to accept this truth. And this cleaning, this purification, it goes deep down. It's not just one of those quick cleans that maybe uh, you're used to or my boys seem particularly used to when you ask them to tidy their rooms. This deep cleaning goes right to the heart of the problem, it goes deep down into the core of our beings, to our very souls. The Bible talks about being born again. That's how great our need is, a needing for rebirth, to start again. And at that moment, we 
we decided to accept as believers here and as these believers that Peter's writing to, that moment we decided to accept, accept and be obedient to the truth, we were instantly declared righteous, pure, these verses say, saved from the penalty of sin. But that's not the end of the story because we see the lasting results. And these lasting results that we see in this verse 22 are that we love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And these lasting results as we grow in our holiness are what the the theologians say. The big word is sanctification. The ongoing results. There's that sense that we're still being saved from the power of sin in our lives even when we've made that decision to follow Jesus. And we don't live perfect lives yet. (laughs) The church is full of sinful people. Sinful people who come to God for salvation, but who are committed to walk in obedience to him, looking forward to the day of his return. And many of us will have made that decision here tonight. So what are these lasting results that Peter points towards? Well, we see clearly that we're to love one another earnestly. So how do we do that? How can we love one another earnestly. Well, first of all, it's not actually possible unless we've been born again. It's not possible unless we have made that decision, unless we've been born again. Now, maybe for some of you, that's offensive, but Peter is talking here about more than something that's, that's, that we're humanly capable of, more than an emotional, affectional response that all of us as humans are, po- are capable of because we're made in God's image. Paul, Peter here is talking um, about a sincere, genuine love and a love which grows as a result of sanctification. A love which grows as we grow in our holiness as a saved people. A love which grows way beyond our human capabilities. And I don't know about you, but that is very good news to someone like me. Someone who actually is not that great at loving people. But God's work within us takes us way beyond what we can humanly do. A love of genuine affection. An earnest love. Sincere Strong, deep, unwavering, through the thick and thin of life. And not dependent on how we got out of bed in the morning. Not dependent on our personality types. But conditional on how the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. And we can all grow in our love for one another. And this is no superficial love we're called to hear. It's no pitching up on a Sunday and saying, hi, how are you? I'm fine. And that's the end of the story. It's about being open and honest with each other. It's about being present with people in our conversations. We all know what it's like when we're speaking to someone and they're physically there, but they're mentally somewhere else, looking beyond you even. That's not the kind of love that Peter is talking about here. That's not what we're to grow in as God's people. It's a getting your hands dirty for each other. Dirt under the fingernails as we serve one another. And we're also called to love one another from a pure heart. Not because we can get anything out of it. Not because it's uh, something that kind of gives us an advantage in life. To give an extreme example, not because it's been filmed on YouTube that you're giving £10 out to a stranger and you can get 3 million hits for it and make a pocket full of money. Not because of anything that we can get out of it. A love that we're called to because we're motivated because of his, Jesus' great love for us and not for any other reason. And that's why this love is a love which is born out of fellowship with him, out of the outworking of the Holy Spirit. 
And he, Jesus, is, of course, the ultimate example of such a love, such a love to win us our salvation. He chose to give up the comforts of heaven, the comforts of being with the Father, and he chose to descend to mankind, to be amongst us, his creations, to be scorned by us whilst living the perfect life and willingly, ultimately, to give up his life for us. Not to bring about anything to his own advantage, but all because of his humble and great love for us and obedience to the Father because of his great love for us. Have a look through Philippians chapter two. This is more than going the extra mile. This is a complete denying of my life's plan and agenda. And it's the the outworking of the Holy Spirit in our lives. (coughs) You know, when we look at um, society around us, we see many people who are hungering for exactly this kind of love. In fact, all of us are hungering for this kind of love. But particularly in the society that we find ourselves in at the moment, there is an extreme hunger for deep, genuine connections and relationships with people, to be loved, to be comforted. So many people, and it's not just in this country, are unsatisfied and sick of a superficial social media world. So many people are sick of just having the highlights of life celebrated and exaggerated and none of the realities, none of the low lights of life even discussed or expressed or confronted. And often a world where relationships are quite skin deep and there's a sense that there's that increasing hunger for real relationships. And that's obvious because that's how we were made. That's how God designed us, to have that real, genuine uh, love for one another. And I wonder if there's anyone here tonight who that rings true. Hungry, a hunger for love, for genuine, authentic relationships. Well, Peter goes on to reinforce in this passage that this new way of living that Uh, that these Christians are called to, this call to holiness, this loving one another, it's not a kind of focus for the season. It's not a one-off. It's not uh, to this, you know, in Africa, we always have a theme for the year. It's not just a theme for the year. Uh, It's to continue throughout their very lives. And Christians here tonight, if you're a Christian, the very way that you have been born again, which is by and from God's word, which is unchanging, and therefore this command is unchanging, and the call is also unchanging, goes with us throughout our whole lives. This is no one-off focus for the season. The Lord's call on us here is to span our whole lifetimes as we go on into eternity. Let's just read those verses from uh, verse 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. And Jesus is described, of course, in the, in the Bible as the word. Peter's not just limiting uh, here to just reading the Bible like a textbook. It's more, it's about experiencing fellowship, the most genuine of relationships with our creator through his word in the Bible. And it's living, it's abiding His words don't have a sell-by date or a best-before date. 
They don't degrade, they don't go moldy, they don't go stale. They're as fresh and relevant today as they ever have been. The absolute moral authority telling us how to live in whatever society we live in. His word cuts through the opinions of the day. They cut through whatever the general consensus is, is, and they give us the definitive answers as to what is right and what is wrong according to him because he is the creator and he is the final authority. And through his word, friendship, fellowship, and that deep, deep satisfaction with our creator is possible through his word. A relationship, a two-way conversation with the creator, your creator, speaking into your life and his spirit at work in you as you're reading his word, making it clear, convicting you, growing you in holiness and producing the fruit that we're talking about today of loving one another in more and more ways, in deeper and deeper expressions. God's word clearly reveals himself. And when you read God's word, it changes us. When you read it, it reveals himself to us. John chapter 7 verse 17 says, Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. And I've not been here for a long time, so I don't know who all of you are. And I don't know, especially if you're just visiting tonight, uh, exploring Christianity. Maybe someone's brought you along and you're very very welcome. But for those of you who are exploring Christianity, can I encourage you to read the Bible for yourself? There's a great book um, by John Lennox and David Gooding called uh, Christianity, Opium or Truth. It's a little quote on the screen, but I'm going to read you a little bit more, a little excerpt from that book. And if you're not a Christian here today, I would urge you just to just to listen and consider these words. It reads, Jesus Christ himself, himself guarantees that provided you are prepared to fulfill one condition, God will show you personally whether his claims are true or not. And the condition is this, if anyone is willing to do God's will, that is when he or she discovers it, he or she will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. That's again John 17. It goes on to say, uh, he or she will find out because as they read and study and think about what Jesus taught, God will speak to their heart and show them beyond a shadow of doubt that what Jesus says is true. But we need to come to him on his terms. Not as if it was a science experiment, you need to commit yourself to the practical implications uh, when he reveals himself to you. We can't come to the Almighty and say, yes, I'd like to know whether you're there or not and whether Jesus Christ is your son or not. Please show me, but I would like you to understand that if you do reveal yourself to me, I, I still am not necessarily prepared to do anything you might tell me to do. God has no time for spiritual dilettantes. But if you are serious and willing to do God's will when you know it, then make the experiment. Read the Gospel of John seriously with an open mind and Jesus Christ guarantees that God will show you what the truth is. And I'd echo those words as well. If you're serious in exploring the claims of Jesus, read his word with that commitment to him that if he, and when he, I would say, reveals himself to you, you'll obedient to what, what he says to you. And then for sure, the Lord will reveal himself to you as you read his word. As we move on, we see that God's word is a firm foundation for us a firm foundation to us as we go through life. 
You know, as Christians, we don't like to think about the fragility of life. I should have said, as humans, we don't like to think about the fragility of life, or even that life will end. We love stability. We crave to be back to normal, don't we, after a pandemic? Probably shouldn't mention it. We look back on fondness at times in our life where we think we saw that things were tranquil, and we don't want to admit, really, that life is rarely like that. We're often presented with that illusion that that stability, tranquility, and a lack of change are all on offer in this world. And then the economy takes a dip for the worse, a mini budget comes out, Uh, the exam results don't go according to plan, Um, the relationship doesn't uh, work out the way that we hoped, take a dramatic turn for the worse, the promotion goes to someone else, the family crisis erupts, or the consultant gives you the news that you've been dreading. But as Christians, our world is not different, but the shifting sands in the world, are all, as they are all around us, we have something different to cling on to, something different that society doesn't have, something to build our lives upon, where when we, when we experience life as everyone else does, something to direct our lives, to change our lives as we grow in holiness. And that is God's very word, his word. And his word will never, ever change. It never changes. We can always rely on it. And therefore, this is, this is Peter's argument, that therefore let's grow in it and grow in our love for one another. And don't think, Christian, that this is an easy thing to do. We already mentioned one of the the difficulties on a mission base is actually just getting on with each other. And and when the pressure is on, when society is squeezing us, um, it's often those that we love who we're closest to that we can lash lash out at. Those of us who are parents know that it's often uh, those who are closest to and we have a bad day at work who get the, the brunt of it. Husbands and wives snapping at each other too easily. Sons and daughters and fathers and mothers not being as they would be in public with each other. And when we see society is against us as Christian, as, it, as, as we feel it squeeze us at times, we can be tempted to do the very opposite of loving one another, to not love one another. We can be tempted to be jealous when we see our Christian brother doing well or our Christian sister doing well as we feel the squeeze of society around us. And the implications in in chapter two and verse one are much wider than just the church. It's that as we live as Christians, as we live out love, this should impact the society around us as well. It should make a difference with our neighbors. There's no differentiation here that Peter highlights. So in the crucible of persecution, these Christians are encouraged to love those who are persecuting them, to not settle the score, to not lie to gain, to not be two-faced hypocrites, to not be jealous of other people and situations that other people are in, not talking badly about each other or others behind their backs. This kind of love should make an impact to the society around us as well. And this isn't easy. It's a journey. It's sanctification. It's being saved. It's it's the work of God's word and fellowship with him being lived out. And enough is never enough. Have a look there in uh, chapter two, verse two. Are you hungry for fellowship with Jesus? Are you hungry for more of him? Enough is never enough when it comes to longing for more of the Lord, for fellowship with him. Many of you know uh, that we've adopted uh, a lovely, beautiful daughter, Joanna. And as part of that process, 
um, uh, I was more involved than I have been in our other children with feeding her um, because she was bottle fed. And I remember clearly when she came to us uh, as a newborn, a few weeks old, I had to take my turn in feeding her with the bottle of milk. And I can remember clearly that hunger, that desperation for milk in her eyes at 3 a.m. while I'm literally trying to work the microwave, measure the right amount. And it, enough was not enough. It had to be quicker. Little Joanna was desperate for milk. She needed milk there and then. Nothing else would do. Try and give her some water, you could forget it. She needed milk. And that's what the image is here in this verse here. I wondered, I wondered you hunger for fellowship with Jesus like that? Like little Joanna, hungering for milk? Or is it a take it and leave it? Do you hunger for fellowship with Jesus through his word? And as a church, do we hunger? We need that fellowship of believers to be effective in ministry in the society around us, to be involved in the society around us, to be salt and light. We can't withdraw and we can't do it by ourselves. We need to grow in our sincere love of one another, flowing out of that fellowship with Jesus by his never, ever changing word of God. If we're just pitching up on a Sunday, friends, this is going to be difficult. This is going to be very difficult to work out. We need to be involved in the detail of people's lives. We need to be praying into their situations. We need to be opening up in our small groups. We need to be in allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. We need to live life with one another. Well, as I um, draw to a, a, a close, nearly, this passage, although it is clearly written to Christians, it definitely presents a question here to those of you who maybe are exploring. Maybe those of you who are not a Christian here tonight. It brings an obvious question to those of you here who have yet to make that decision um, that Peter talks about. The passage points towards two distinct groups of people, and these two groups of people will be represented in the room here tonight. In the ESV translation, it uses that word if in verse 3. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Two groups of people, those who have tasted, those who have experienced that the Lord is good, and those who are still hungry, like newborn babies, hungry for milk, a hunger for something, an itch that can't be satisfied, something that is missing in your life. And the two groups of people in this passage are not grouped according to how good or bad their lives are. They're distinguished in chapter 1, verse 22, by those who have obeyed the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. People who have seen their need of a saviour, a need for someone to deal with the root problem of sin in their life for purity through Jesus Christ. And the other group who sadly reject Jesus' claims. You still think, in effect, that Jesus is a liar. You're shaking your heads in disbelief at his claims. And maybe that offends you, but that is what God's word, his never ever changing word, confronts you with tonight. The truth on your reality without him, and the truth on reality with him. But his word tonight also presents you with an invitation. Not only the truth of your current situation, but the truth on your situation as it could be with him. He invites you today. 
Psalm 34, verse 8 reads, Taste and see that the Lord is good. It's an invitation. Jesus is there waiting. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Maybe you've tried lots of other things to be satisfied. Things which have just left you feeling hungry for more. And Jesus, your creator, is inviting you to a relationship with him, to take refuge in him. And if that's you here tonight, don't leave here. Don't leave here this evening unsatisfied. Don't leave here unforgiven. I'd encourage you just to speak to the person who brought you, or to me, or to Colin, or any of the other leaders here, and we can show you again from God's word how he says to have a restored relationship with him. And finally, as I close now, for those of us here who have tasted, who have seen that the Lord is good, don't withdraw from society. Don't pull out. Even when we face hostilities because of our faith, keep feeding on his word. Keep growing in our holiness, springing from that relationship, our fellowship with our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's love one another deeply, sincerely, and for all of our lives. Amen. Let's just bow our heads. Father, we thank you that you have given us your word. Father, that we thank you that it is like nothing else. It endures through all generations. It changes us. Broken people made pure by your son. Broken people who are made capable of loving one another. Despite our backgrounds, despite everything else, all made possible because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I also want to pray for anyone in this room tonight who is confronted, maybe is even uncomfortable hearing God's word tonight, your word. I pray, Lord, that um, you would convict them and I pray that they would be bold enough to speak to someone tonight if that's your will. We pray For us, as we go from here, the week ahead, may we be salt and light in the society we find ourselves, not for our good, but for your glory, Lord Jesus. Amen.